Hi everybody! If you watched one of the previous videos in which we created a square grid, you might have wondered how difficult it would be to achieve a similar effect with perfectly aligned hexagons. There are some certain differences, but the algorithm is not extremely complex. Let's get into it. So once again, we'll start by creating a new 2D scene. Right click, create new and scene. Let's call it hexa, eh, I mean hexa gone and okay. And as usual, right click at child node and color rect. Let's set um, its dimensions in layout transform we usually work on 600 by 400 uh, rectangle and of course we need to set the material as a new shader material click create a new shader that would be called hexagon gd shader of canvas item type but we want to put it to the shaders folder in create and click again to open the editor okay so uh, as i hinted at the beginning to create a hexagonal grid we need to use a slightly different approach because hexagons are not arranged horizontally and vertically like squares. Instead, they need to be shifted slightly to fit together nicely, as we can see on this image and probably somewhere down there. Yeah, this is an example of a hexagonal grid. Okay, good. So back to Godot. Uh, to achieve this, we will create a new function called hex and gradually improve it. We'll start with the minimum, minimal uh, valid code. Okay, let me make more space for that. And we will start with deleting the code we don't need. Nothing but a fragment function remains there. Okay, so as I said, creating a new function, which we want to call hex, it will return float as it's supposed to return a color, uh, I mean, uh, the shade of gray. And vec2 uh, input parameter would be p, which is basically the UV coordinates, but I called it p as the position of the particle hex in the uh, hexagon in the hexagonal grid. And just to return something, let's start with with the uh, x coordinate to make the function valid. And now the fragment function. So as usual, we'll start with shifting the origin from the top left corner to the center by subtracting 0.5 from both coordinates and fix the fix the aspect ratio for which we need to define the uniform parameter, uniform vec2 resolution, that would be set to vec2 600 by 400, just like we created the created the color rect in the inspector. Okay, and now we can use it here to recalculate the x coordinate uvx would be multiplied by a uh, resolution x divided by a resolution y okay and now the color of the particular uh, pixel so we would create variable vector3 color as it has red green and blue components that's by vector3 and it starts at <coughs> zero for all components which is black and we want to add the value returned from the hex function and convert it to a vector 3 so it would be sorry <laughs> a hex of uv okay and finally we need to assign the result to the internal variable color in capital letters which is vector 4 so we need to Compose it from this vector 3 and add another component as the alpha value. Okay, very well. So, a similar gradient serves as a basis for most of our effects. In this case, 
since we shifted the origin from top left corner to the center, the value x, which is in this direction, var uh, <coughs> ranges from negative 0 0.5, 0 to 0.5, corresponding to these shades of gray, because negative values are automatically displayed as zero or black. Now, to achieve a simple line, we'll apply the absolute value and change the argument to be y, so uh, as we want to create a horizontal line. So first of all, as I said, let's change it to y coordinate. It should switch, yes. And now wrap an absolute value around that. Abs. Okay, we have a line, but maybe it's too wide. Let's make it a little bit thinner. So we'll multiply the argument by two. Okay, better. That would be one part of the hexagon. For the second part, we want to have a diagonal line, which we'll achieve with the following change. Return apps and px plus by. <coughs> yes. By the way, notice that the Godot shading language ignores everything beyond the first return it encounters in a function. Many other languages would throw a compilation error, but Godot, our Godot shading language, does not, allowing us to use this trick for debugging and other purposes. Of course, we must remember to remove all unnecessary returns once we reach the final version of the code. The slope of this line doesn't look too uh, hexagonal. Let's improve it. We can uh, multiply bx by some uh, constant to change the slope, for example, 1.5. All right, that's a bit better right away. We haven't achieved complete accuracy, which means a slope of 60 degrees. But we'll address that later. For now, we'll settle for this approximation and combine both lines into a single calculation, which we'll achieve by applying the max function. So we will have as the argument would be maximum of this value and the other one. Let me delete this and fix the bracket. No, no, no. I remove this one. Sorry. Okay. And we have the basis of a hexagon. So far, it's just one vertex and two incomplete edges. But we'll achieve the rest through horizontal and vertical mirroring. Now, we need some periodic function to lay the foundation of a hexagonal grid. As we know from before, to create any grid, the fract function is best suited, which returns the fractional part of a float parameter. So I will add this, p is fract of p, okay, all right, something shows up. To see more of it, let's adjust a zoom factor in the fragment function that would be down here. So we will just multiply UV by, let's say, 5. Okay. So as we can see, our ornament is centered in the top left corner of each cell. Let's move it to the center. We'll use the same trick as we did here for moving the global origin. So we will subtract 0.5 from this minus 0.5. Okay, and now let's perform the announced trick with mirroring using the absolute value. Apps and this. Okay, before we proceed further, it would be good to invert the colors to get a black grade on a white background. We'll do this by subtracting the resulting value from 1. So here we would just add 1 minus maximum of these two arguments. Very well, well done. The hexagons are starting to become visible. However, their positioning needs to be corrected because they are currently displayed in a square grid, which is not what we want. 
let's adjust the y coordinate. Now we apply the second function, which forms the basis of a similar effect, namely floor, which returns the integer part of a float parameter. I will put it here. P y is increased by floor of P x. Okay, it seems like nothing has changed. Why is that? As we know, hexagons do not align with each other unit by unit, but rather jump diagonally uh, by half units. Let's make the appropriate adjustment in our calculation, which means we need to multiply this by 0.5. Great. This already closely resembles the final product Certainly, we would like the grades to be displayed without this internal uh, gradient in each cell. So, instead of returning shades of gray, we'll limit ourselves to black and white based on an appropriately chosen threshold value. In other words, we'll encapsulate our result in the step function. So, it would be step and let's choose zero... Uh, 0 0.05 as a threshold and end bracket. Okay, our effect is nearly a perfect hexagonal grid. The last adjustment remaining is to change the slope of the diagonal edge to match 60 degrees. To achieve this, we'll define a special constant that equals the sine of this angle, 60 degrees. Let's do it uh, here. Const float, I will call it x shift, for instance. And as I said, it would be a sine of 60 degrees, which is pi divided by 3 in radians. OK, this value could be also calculated as half the square root of 3. Uh, anyway. It's convenient to create this constant so that uh, we don't have to calculate the sine or square root for each fragment separately. And now we just need to divide the x coordinate by this value to achieve a perfect hexagonal grid. I will do it here. Px is divided by x shift. We can say that the mission was accomplished. What's next? Let's try some layers and effects. And to not only mix black and white grids, let's add a function for generating a color palette. It's a commonly known function for which I've only defined specific input parameters, so I'll just paste it here using copy and paste. It should be ready right here. Copy and paste. Very well, here it is for colors and the uh, algorithm calculation that returns uh, vector 3 as another color. Very well, now in the fragment function we'll remove the static zoom, this line, and replace it with a value that depends on the current index in the loop because we are going to create several uh, layers and loop through them and also the current time. Let's make these adjustments. So I will just get rid of this. And now we need to create to create the cycle for float i from 1 to yeah. <clears throat> and I increased by one. Let's do this. First, we will create a color for the specific layer. Let's call it B as we take it from the palette. Palette function that takes I as the first argument and then all four predefined colors. Color A color B, color 
C, space is missing, and color D. Okay. <coughs> this is the color, and now we will need to use this line, but a little bit modified. Let me cut and paste here, and instead of this, we will improve that by multiplying the UV as we are using the dynamic zoom now. Let's say 5 plus I multiplied by 0.5. Okay, but this is definitely not our final uh, product. We need to do some more things. I will do, for example, this absolute value of sine of time multiplied by i by 0.1 plus cosine i. Okay, something is changing its position, but it is still not perfect. One, two, three. Yes, this is what I did plus sine time int multiplied by p. This is a pretty complex calculation, but it is basically a result of experiments I did before recording this video. So that's why I didn't uh, fully explain all these steps. Let's just say that you can do your alcohol or your own calculations here and probably uh, reach something similar or completely different. But I say I would I pretty much like this one. So it seems that some colors or some color shades are not very visible. Perhaps in this case it would be better to invert the resulting color in the hex function, which means I will subtract it from one. And we are done. Of course, you can also set the colors in a different way. For example, using a uniform parameter for each layer separately or some pseudo-random generator. Similarly, we can change the number of layers, which is now a fixed number 5. The function for modifying the zoom factor, uh, add some kind of rotation and so on. Thank you for watching. This was just one of many ways to create a hexagonal grid using a shader. However, it's one of the simpler ones to understand and improve upon, which is why I chose it. Anyway, I wish you a good luck with your projects and I'll see you in the next video.